the point of this lecture is to explain your cyclic voltometry experiment in a little bit more detail. And so what I hope you'll walk away with from this lecture is a little bit of a feeling of why voltometry, uh, cyclic voltammograms look the way they do, how you'll process your data, and what's behind the mysterious randall sevchik equation that you're going to use when analyzing your data. So a, a voltometry experiment consists of applying a known potential to a working electrode and then measuring the current that's generated when your analyte is either reduced or oxidized at the surface of that electrode. In cyclic voltometry, um, this looks like something like this. So the potential that you're applying to a working electrode is not constant. It changes as a function of time. So you're scanning from one volt down to 0 0.3, and then you're reversing the scan and scanning back up all the way to one volt. And you're going to do this at different scan speeds, and so maybe this whole cycle is just going to take you 10 seconds, or maybe it's going to take you 100 seconds, and just go a lot more slowly, depending on the scan speed that you're going at. As you scan this potential, the the potential in the working electrode keeps decreasing, which means that it's going to be more and more strongly reducing, and eventually your analyte gets reduced at the electrode and you get a reduction current. Then when you turn things around, the electrode becomes more and more oxidizing, and so eventually what you're going to measure is oxidation of your analyte at the surface of the electrode, and you measure an oxidation current. <coughs> The cyclic voltammogram looks like this. You're going to plot current as a function of the potential on your working electrode. And like I said, you're going to go from high to low voltage. And so you start at a high voltage. You measure the current. There's not much current. Eventually, once the voltage gets low enough, you're going to start measuring a current that's a reduction current. So the current peaks. Then it diminishes. Now you turn the voltage around, and so now you're going to start measuring an oxidizing current. It peaks, and then you finish here. So that's one cycle of your cyclic voltammogram. Um, note the convention here. Reduction is a negative current, right? And you're plotting your voltage from low to high. So that's why you're going from right to left in the way you're doing your experiment. Chemistry texts actually use opposite conventions here. So the, the figures you'll see in your readings and also the figure in the protocol um, always uh, look something like this, where actually the cathodic current is plotted as a positive current. So this is your reduction current, right? And the, the current is the PC, is the, the peak current, cathodic current is plotted here. And the voltage is plotted from high to low. So if you were plotting things with this convention, your experiment would scan from here, get a cathodic current, go over here, come down this way, and end up back here. So what I want to talk about now is why voltammograms are shaped the way they are. Some people think they're shaped like ducks. There are two effects at play here. The first one is kind of an equilibrium effect um, described by the Nernst equation. And this effect is simply that reduction can't occur until the potential on the electrode is sufficiently reducing. The second effect is that is a, is a transport effect, which is that the, the longer you have a reducing potential on the working electrode, the more you deplete the analyte near the electrode. And so the current is limited by the rate of transport of analyte to the electrode. So let's start by talking about the Nernst equation. We have the half reaction hexachloroiridate um, being reduced by one electron. And the Nernst equation for that looks like this. And um, you're probably used to thinking about calculating half cell potentials, E, given the standard potential of the half reaction. So this is a constant for the hexachloroiridate. And then the concentrations of the product and, and the reactant of the half reaction. But we can use the Nernst equation another way. We can rearrange it. And it tells us something about the ratio of reduced to oxidized hexachloroiridate as a function of the potential, E, on the working electrode. 
And so what this equation says is this ratio, reduced to oxidized hexachloroiridate, this ratio doesn't start getting real large until this side of the equation is positive or until the potential at the working electrode E becomes less than the standard potential of the redox couple. So when you look at your cyclic voltammogram, you can think about this. Um, when you start out at a very high potential, you shouldn't really get any reduction because the Nernst equation tells you that for these E's, the reduction is just not thermodynamically favored. And then as you approach E0, reduction becomes more and more thermodynamically favored and then really takes off once you have a potential on your working electrode E that's less than the E0 of the half reaction. Now, now the Nernst equation can't explain why things start to drop off here because you're reducing the voltage even further, so you're increasing the driving force for reduction even further, and yet the current drops off. So what's up with that? Why does the reduction current decrease even though you're decreasing the potential further? So this is where the transport thing comes in. The, the Nernst equation really only applies to the concentration of reduced and oxidized hexachloroiridate right next to the electrode. That's where things are at equilibrium. Um, but as I said before, the analyte is going to start getting depleted near the electrode, the oxidized hexachloroiridate will start to be de depleted. And you set up this diffusion layer, and then the current is going to t depend on the rate at which the analyte can diffuse to the surface of the electrode. So I made a little graph to hopefully help you understand what's going on here. So this is what I'm graphing here is the concentration of the oxidized hexachloroiridate as a function of distance from the electrode surface. And so if there were no potential at all on the electrode surface, then the concentration of hexachloroiridate oxidized um, is going to stay the same everywhere in solution, and it's going to be equal to what I'm going to call the bulk concentration. So that's the concentration you made the solution up to be. But now imagine that at the electrode surface, right here at distance zero, um, I have a reducing potential. Well, at that reducing potential now, all of my hexachloroiridate should be reduced, and I sh the concentration of the oxidized form here should drop to zero. So um, as soon as there's a reducing potential, I should go to zero here. But then far enough away from the electrode surface, um, the, the hexachloroiridate won't really have seen the effect of that yet, and so it should be at the bulk concentration. So what that looks like is that, you know, a short time after you reach that reducing potential at the electrode surface, you have a concentration gradient like this, where this goes to zero at the surface, and then it goes up more or less linearly until it reaches the bulk concentration further away from the surface. And then as you keep going, with this, um, you start depleting the hexachloroiridate more and more that's near the surface. So, so more and more diffuses toward the electrode, more and more gets reduced, and what happens is you have an increased thickness of this diffusion layer because the area that's affected by all that reduction that's destroying this oxide species at the electrode surface, the longer you give that to work, the, the more of this it's going to destroy. So you increase the size of your diffusion layer and it keeps going. And if you waited a long, long time, it would look something like this. <coughs> so to understand why that decreases the current, you have to think about Fick's law. Um, Fick's law says that the rate of the diffusion of the oxidized hexachloroiridate to the electrode surface is, is proportional to the concentration gradient. So the, the equation for Fick's law looks like this. You have a diffusion rate equal to, this is the proportionality constant, which is the diffusion coefficient of that compound that w that's diffusing. And here's the concentration gradient, the change in concentration over the change in distance. So for our setup here, the change in concentration is the difference between the concentration in the bulk solution 
and the concentration of the surface, this part is probably close to zero, and then this change in distance is that thickness of the diffusion layer. So if we go back to this plot, delta C is this distance here, right? And delta X is this distance here at an earlier time, it's this distance here at a slightly later time. So delta X, the longer we go, the bigger delta X becomes. And so this doesn't change, it's always the same distance. This keeps growing the longer we have a reducing potential at the electrode surface, and so the rate of diffusion just keeps slowing down with time. And that's why um, once you get past this peak, you get this diminishing current as a function of time because you're de depleting the analyte near the working electrode surface, and the, the rate at which diffusion supplies analyte to the electrode surface is just going to keep getting slower and slower. Now, if you look at this, <coughs> you will see that the current actually never does reach zero, right? It, it kind of levels out. Um, there's still some reduction current way at the end, even though it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it, it wants to approach zero. And that's where you're starting with this slight negative current when you start going in the opposite direction. So what's going on there? is called non-Faraday currents. So this, next to having a, an oxidation reduction reaction happening at the electrode surface, the other thing you can do is actually just accumulate charge at the electrode surface. And so that moves charge around, right? It moves charge to the electrode. And so that will create a current that you can measure. And, and the amount of charge, total charge you should accumulate is, is proportional to the potential at that electrode, but because you keep changing that potential, right, you're scanning the potential, somehow you never reach equilibrium there. So that creates a, a non-Nernstein current. Another thing that might happen, actually, is that if your potential is really low or really high, you might start reducing or oxidizing other compounds with your working electrode. So one example that you're, you're probably going to see this a little. It doesn't show up too too well on this graph. Um, at the at the potential where you start out at, you can actually oxidize a little water, and so you often have this little positive tail at high voltages. That's actually an oxidation current that comes from oxidizing water. So those things happen too, and and so what you need to do is you need to subtract out these currents which aren't telling you anything about your analyte. Uh, as a background. So how do you do these background corrections? Well, first of all, you need to know what you're really looking for. And what you're really looking for is the peak currents, uh, the peak oxidation and the peak reduction currents. So current, the symbol is I, P stands for peak, and the C stands for cathodic, so that's the reduction current, and this A stands for anodic, so that's the oxidation current. So when you're trying to background correct those currents, you can't just read this off the graph like this. What you really want to do is subtract out a baseline. And the baseline is what you expect this background current to do if you extrapolate it to the time that your peak current occurs. So you're, you're basically just extrapolating this baseline current out to over here with a straight line, and then you're measuring the distance from that baseline. And so that distance, in this case, this is the reduction peak you're looking at, so that's your IPC, is that distance. And it's, it's not quite the value, the raw value here, right, because this is a little bit different from zero. The oxidation current, it's even more dramatic. You have a baseline that looks like this, and you know, I realize that it's not really that easy to guess at what this background current is going to do over here. We, we take our best shot at drawing a straight line to the data we've, we've obtained before that peak starts coming out, and, and the uncertainty in where to put that straight line has, gives you some uncertainty in what IPA is going to come out to be, but in, in any case, you do your best 
drawing a straight line through that background current, you look at the distance from that line to the peak, and that gives you your peak oxidation current, IPA. Now, the, the protocol says that IPC should equal IPA once you've done these background corrections, and so I just want to talk about that for a minute. And, and so what's going on here is, you know, we talked about how at high potential we have all the oxidized hexachloroiridate and it's not getting reduced yet, right? And then we talked about how once the potential starts getting lower now, the hexachloroiridate is getting reduced at the working electrode, giving you that reduction current. And then we talked about how if you keep just a reducing voltage at that working electrode, the current gets smaller and smaller just because the, uh, the hexachloroiridate near the working electrode gets reduced and depleted near the surface of that electrode, right? And, and so we had this kind of thing where if you wait long enough, um, you really don't have any more of the oxidized form. The concentration is very low near the surface of the electrode, and you've really reduced it all. And so by the time we get to here, that reduction current is kind of dropping off. All I've got now is my background current. And so by the time we get to here, to the electrode, it looks like it's in a solution of reduced hexachloroiridate, even though in the bulk solution, most of the hexachloroiridate is still oxidized. So to, to the electrode now, it looks like it's sitting in a solution of all reduced hexachloroiridate, and now you're making the surface of the electrode more and more oxidizing, and at first not much wants to happen except some changes in this background. And eventually, as you start nearing E0, you're, you're going to start to oxidize all that reduced hexachloroiridate, and then it's just the reverse of what you were doing before. You reach that peak, but now you have diffusion limitations, so it drops off and goes back to this background current. So really, because everything is reduced near the electrode, you end up doing exactly the reverse here that you did here. But don't forget that in your bulk solution, you still have mostly the oxidized species. So the final thing I want to talk about a little bit is the reynolds sevchik equation that you're going to use to analyze your data. Now, we're just going to take this equation as a given but I at least want to wave my hands about a, a few features of this equation and, and relate it to everything I just talked about. So this is the equation that gives you the, the peak current as a function of the number of electrons in the, in the half reaction, the area of the electrode, this diffusion coefficient, bulk concentration of your analyte, and the scan rate. Now, I just want to talk about a few things. Now that you know that the rate at which analyte is delivered to the surface of the electrode is diffusion limited, I think you can picture why that peak current should be related to the diffusion coefficient of that analyte in the solution. So that's where that comes from. And you also saw from Fick's law that the rate of diffusion is proportional to the bulk concentration of the analyte. So that gives you a feeling for where that C comes from in the equation. The scan rate, that's a little bit more subtle, but if you think about it, if you are scanning very quickly, then you don't give the, that diffusion layer a lot of time to get really thick. And so that's why you have a faster rate of diffusion still. By the time you hit that peak current, you have a faster rate of diffusion to the surface than you would if you had a very slow scan rate and you're giving that diffusion layer a lot of time to form and, and become thicker and thicker by the time you hit that same potential. So that's what the scan rate is all about.